right, well, uh, greetings. It's great to be with you this evening. It's great to uh, be able to sing the praises of the Lord together. And uh, greetings to you from everyone at Village Church. Uh, both Nelson and I were talking before about how it is that uh, we've both uh, spent some time this morning preaching our hearts out. And uh, I'm not used to speaking on a Sunday night, so I'm kind of here uh, in body and I'm sort of melting on the inside. So I appreciate your prayers. Um, Nelson's a strong man and he managed to do both. So uh, we are here by the Lord's grace, aren't we not? And uh, this evening I want to look at Psalm 34, a psalm which has always encouraged me. I'm sure you are familiar with it. I want to read that with you first and foremost and then seek the Lord in prayer. So if you will turn with me to Psalm 34 and we'll read this together. Psalm 34, a psalm of David. Verse 1 says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps round those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to meet together as your people. As a people who have been washed, cleansed, sanctified and reconciled to you, Father, by the life, death and resurrection of your Son. We want to thank you for that saving work of Christ on the cross. And Father God, as we spend time together this evening considering your word we want to pray and ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bring to our souls much encouragement. We ask, Father, that you would continue to magnify your own goodness to us, that we might see you with clarity, that we might have a broader and deeper and richer and clearer understanding of your person, of your nature, of your character and of your attributes. And, Father, as we consider your word, as we consider your Son, uh, his goodness, his righteousness. I pray, Lord God, that you would um, do a mighty work within our souls tonight. Father, we, I pray and ask that you, by your grace, would speak through me to your children, uh, that you would guide my lips, uh, my mind, my heart, my soul, and that you would see fit to use me for your glory, uh, that, Father, I may praise your name and that we all leave here this, this evening being able to praise your name with one voice. Father, I ask that you would move amongst us and do this great work this evening. Lord, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that it is indeed living, active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it does indeed pierce our souls. And it is indeed a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And Father, I pray as we consider your word right now, 
I pray, Lord God, that you would continue to speak to us through it. We want to give you thanks for this time together, and we ask for your blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, if you look at your copy of the scriptures, you'll see this little subheading above verse 1. And it'll tell you that this psalm was written by David, and it'll give you the occasion as to why he wrote this. It says that this occurred, and this was a response to the time when he, David, changed his behaviour before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and he went away. Now that account you can find in 1 Samuel 21, and we won't turn there now, but you can look at this later. But to, to boil it down and to break it down for you, you will find that at that point in time, David is coming to the end of his rope, so to speak. He's being pursued by Saul. Over and over again, he's running from Saul. And perhaps in frustration, or perhaps as a human solution, he thinks within himself, I'll go to the town of the Philistines, I'll go to Gath, and I will see this Abimelech, or Akish was his other name, and I will seek refuge there. So off he goes, and he seeks refuge in, of all places, a Philistine city. And he's obviously there, and someone whispers in the king's ear and says, do you know who this is who you are looking after? This is David. You remember the song? Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And David becomes aware of this, and he becomes very afraid. And his response to this fearful, terrifying situation is to pretend to be mad. And it says there in the passage in Samuel that he lets spittle run down his beard, an offensive uh, thing to do in the pre presence of a Middle Eastern person back then. And Akish thinks he's mad and he drives him out. And that is the context of this psalm. And as you will realise, there was no real recognition or acknowledgement of David's own madness there. David does not pat himself on the back and say, wow, what a plan it worked. There's no mention of that at all. In fact, David avoids saying that. There is no mention of David's faithlessness in this situation. There is nothing at all. It is all about the Lord. Charles Spurgeon actually comments on this and he says this. David played the fool with singular, singular dexterity, but he was not so real a fool as to sing of his own exploits of folly. End quote. And it's true. David realises that his own human ingenuity or cunning did not get him out of that fix that he found himself in. It was God and it was God alone. As a response to that, he is overwhelmed with the fact that God is good and that God always hears the cry of his people. And that is what this wonderful psalm is about. It is a wonderful response of David who is delivered by his great God in the midst of his adversity. And that seems to be a common trait for David, does it not? It almost seems as though every psalm you read is David responding to the goodness of God. It is David suffering or finding himself in some adverse situation and God delivers and God hears and God brings peace and God is David's contentment over and over again. That is the pattern that we see. David knows this all too well. And I think for us the same is true in life, is it not? We learn in theory and we read the scriptures and we know that God is a deliverer. We know that God hears us and he delights to hear the prayers of his children. And we know that when we cry out, he will be there to rescue and deliver. Yet those truths that we learn in theory really only ever mean a great deal to us when we go through the fires of testing. Isn't that right? When we go through adversity, they, they seem to come to life and they grab hold of our hearts. And then the response isn't just a, an intellectual assent to what we've just learnt. It's a response of love and praise, adoration and worship to God. That's just how things work. Really, we could say it this way, that it isn't till our faith is tried and tested that the person of God and his great work become extremely dear to our hearts. It's kind of like the anchor in the boat, that thing that sits up the front. It doesn't become precious and valuable until the storm hits, right? 
Otherwise, it's kind of in the way and a heavy weight to bear. But when that storm hits, it is valuable. Jonathan Edwards kind of said it this way. There would be no manifestation of God's grace or true goodness if there was no sin to be pardoned, no misery to be saved from, end quote. He's pointing out that obvious fact that we truly treasure the grace of God and the goodness of God when our sins overwhelm us, when our circumstances press heavy upon us. But here in the narrative from 1 Samuel, David is in a terrifying situation. David finds himself in a life-threatening situation, we could say. His response and his reaction is to, to use human means to get out of it. But ultimately, he comes out of this situation realising that God has delivered him. His response, well, it's a response of praise. Now, I preached this sermon, I think it was a year or so ago, and I remember the circumstances that I found myself in when I was preaching this. And this psalm ministered to my soul like nothing else. And I would have to testify and agree with David's encounter that the more difficult and painful and hard a, a set of circumstances are, then the more we cry out to the Lord, find his deliverance, find peace, find comfort, and the response is always praise and glorifying of the Lord. And I'm convinced that God allows difficulties and hardships and all sorts of calamities in our lives to drive the worldliness out of us, to Free our hands up from the things of this world so that we will cling on to him all the more. And in clinging to him and in holding on to him, it's there that we find strength. It's there that we find peace and joy and happiness and contentment. That is how God drives the idols out of our life, is it not? That's what he does. He wrings the worldliness and the flesh and the sin out of us through hardships. And he replaces it with himself. Augustine said it this way, God is always trying to give good things to us, but our hands are too full to receive them. It's a truism, isn't it? God is always trying to give good things to us, but our hands are too full to receive them. So this psalm, well, this psalm is, it's all about the goodness of the Lord. Uh, and we're going to consider tonight just a few of the effects of the goodness of the Lord that it has in the life of the believer. I want to just go through a list of them. And I want to start with this first one, which is found in verses 1 to 3. The goodness of the Lord produces praise. Now, that's obvious, right? You can see it there in the text, verses 1 to 3. As David considers the great deliverance of the Lord uh, upon his own life, he rightly and fittingly begins to praise the Lord. Uh, in, in fact, praise is always the normal uh, regular and common response of those who are acutely aware of who God is, right? When people see God with clarity, when people's eyes are opened to his person, his character, his mighty works, then the response is always praise. And that is why when people stand in this pulpit, when people lead a Bible study, when anyone serves in any teaching capacity in a church, it's always to magnify the person of the Lord, right? Right? It's always to proclaim truth because when people see God with clarity, they praise him accordingly. Don't see God with clarity, you will not praise him as he deserves to be praised. How can you encounter the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures and walk away just giving mental assent, right? How can that happen? When we truly encounter Christ according to his word, when we see him with clarity, there will be a heart of praise and thanksgiving. That is how this works. That's why David says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. This is a reaction and a response to what he has just been through. All times I will bless the Lord. His praise shall what? Continually be in my mouth. During the good and the bad times, on the mountaintop when life is good, down in the deep, dark valley when life is hard and painful, in any and every situation, David is saying, I will praise the Lord. I will bless him at all times. You'll notice there that David does this audibly. Uh, the scripture tells us that the mouth does what? It speaks of that which fills the heart. Or from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is on the inside cannot but come out of us. 
And that's what's going on in David. He's so filled with praise. In fact, if you look at verse 2, he tells us what's going on inside. Look at what he says regarding his soul. He says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. My soul, let the humble hear and be glad. This is coming out of his mouth from the depth of his being. He has been greatly moved and affected by this mighty deliverance of God. The goodness of God has affected him amazingly. But what about that phrase there regarding the the humble hearing this and rejoicing? What does that even mean? What does it mean to us? Well, think of it this way. It's generally only the humble who boast in the Lord, right? It's generally those who are lowly, uh, the downcast, the outcast, who make their praise in the Lord. A king typically would not boast in the Lord. What would he boast in? His riches his power, his kingdom, his his might, his wisdom, and and everything that he has, he would boast in. He would generally not boast in the Lord. That's the role of a humble person. So when a humble person sees the mighty king, who typically boasts in his wisdom and his power and his riches, boasting in the Lord, then it gives them hope. It's a great example, which is a rarity for them. And they themselves find strength, And confidence in boasting in the Lord. For if the king who is mighty can do it, then we ought to do it as well. What an example and a testimony for those who are humble and lowly to follow. David goes on in verse 3 and he, it isn't just himself who's praising the Lord or boasting in the Lord. He calls everyone to join him. Isn't that the case for all of us when The Lord's goodness fills our own hearts. We don't want to keep silent. And we want to see all of God's people joining in with us the praises of the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And there's nothing like it, isn't there? When you have a whole group of believers who with one heart and one soul want to praise the Lord, sing and speak of his goodness Speak of his greatness. Nothing thrills the soul more. It's a wonderful thing to consider. My mind immediately goes to heaven. Uh, You know, here on earth, you may have an event where uh, you get a whole bunch of believers together and you're singing praises to God. I remember being at seminary and we had three and a half thousand people all singing praises. You can see the T4G conferences and different things like that where 10,000 believers all sing praises great hymns of the faith and so forth and it it puts goosebumps all over your body it's amazing but heaven heaven is the place where all of the believers who have gone to be with the lord are present the heavenly host the angels are all there and they are all seeing god with absolute clarity they are seeing god with absolute clarity with precise understanding there's no error there's no confusion they see him for who he is Now, if that is the situation that's going on in heaven, and we believe it is, then what would be the response of those in heaven? Would it be a folding of the arms and la, 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 la? Or would there be joyful praising from the depth of their soul? Turn to Revelation chapter 4. I'll show you what goes on in heaven when believers and angels see their God with clarity. And this will be us one day, obviously. Revelation chapter 4. Verses 8 to 11, the response from all of heaven to the person and the majesty of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. You see, praise is the reward of those who know God. And that is the natural response to the goodness of God. We, We praise him for who he is. But there's another effect that the goodness of the Lord has in the life of the believer. And it's found in verses 4 to 7. And that is this, that the goodness of the Lord is boldly declared. 
What do I mean by that? Well, those who have experienced the goodness of the Lord, those who have tasted that the Lord is indeed good, cannot but help give testimony to the Lord's goodness. We heard it just tonight with Fred sharing with us. I think that on the one hand, praise is an automatic response, but the other side of the coin is a verbal testimony to God's goodness. How can you be silent when God has liberated you from the depths of sin? How can you be silent when God has come to your aid and rescued you from the pit of despair? It's impossible. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. That one, that person, and you know who they are. And Each church has a handful and, and Lord willing we're all going to become like that. That person who you just can't keep quiet. They're always filled with the praise of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. They're always talking about how the Lord during the week has invaded their life, filled their hearts, opened their mind to his word and brought joy to their soul. That's what happens when we experience the goodness of the Lord. Look at verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And they were very real fears. He says, as what, by way of a summary statement almost, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. That's a memory verse I have etched into my brain. Uh, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. To many in ancient cultures, the poor were what? They were treated with disdain, with contempt. It would be highly unlikely that a king would even give a poor person the time of day. Some cultures saw the poor as being cursed of God, kind of like a karma thing where they were in the situation they were in because it was their own wrongdoing in for some reason or another. But our God is very different. Our God is good, our God is kind, and the scripture tells us that the Lord hears their cry. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. We think of Israel in Egypt, the people of God, slaves in Egypt for some 400 years. God came to their aid. Why? Because they cried out to him with one voice and he heard them and he delivered them. The scripture tells us that, well, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that those who are poor in spirit are what? Blessed. Why are they blessed? Because the Lord hears their cry continually and comes to their aid. Those who are not poor in spirit generally don't cry out because they're full, they're satisfied, they're contented. But the poor person who is poor in spirit will continually cry to the Lord and the Lord will continually come to his aid. Take a look at verse 7. Again, David is making a bold declaration of God's goodness to his people. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fears him, who fear him, and delivers them. Again, it's a clear reference to the Israelites or the Jewish person's understanding of the Exodus. The fact that the angel of the Lord was present with God's people in the pillar of fire and the cloud. He was there at the rock when it was split. He provided for his people. Um, he was there in the burning bush when he spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Um, having done a bit of a study on this recently, I am convinced that the angel of the Lord was a pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ who was with his people Israel through the wilderness wanderings, bringing them out of Egypt. God here promises to deliver his children when they cry to him. And you know this deliverance, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because we think that that means that God will get me out of every sticky situation and that I will never go through any hardship or any difficulty. Well, it's partially true. And that's what David's talking about. He is saying that I was, uh, I was having a near-death experience. I was about to be killed by the king of Gath and God rescued me and saved my life. But there is also another kind of deliverance. And that is this that God gives us the grace and the strength to stand firm through the trial, where we might suffer, where we might experience ill health, persecution, poverty of some kind. 
Deliverance is also the ability to, to grant a believer the ability to get through the trial and to endure, not running away, not giving up, not failing to trust the Lord. That is also a form of deliverance. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The Lord has just told these believers who are in prison that Satan, sorry, Satan is going to imprison them for a number of days and after that they will die. But Christ says, I will give you the crown of life. This is the idea of conquering through death, being delivered through death, which is not a normal way of thinking about things, is it? So that's what it means to, to be delivered, to have the Lord hear your prayer. But another effect of the goodness of the Lord in the life of the believer is this, and it's, it's found in verses 8 to 10. The goodness of the Lord draws us to him. The goodness of the Lord draws us to God. And I love what David says here in verse 8. He appeals to everyone who's listening. He says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He can only say that and make that appeal because he himself has experienced this. David wants everyone to have what he has, if you know what I mean. What he has experienced of God, the effects of the goodness of the Lord in his own soul, he wants every other believer to have. That's the heart of a pastor, right? That's the heart of an elder. That's the heart of anyone who has tasted of the Lord. Isn't that why we go out on the streets and preach the gospel? It's not to argue with people about who's right and who's wrong. We want them to know the Lord like we know the Lord. We want them to live and to come to life by way of the gospel. David says in verse 9, O fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. What's he doing here? He wants people to know how good the Lord is so that they will be drawn to him, not repelled from him, so that they will run to him in time of need because he is so good. You'll notice that there are some conditional commands here in the passage. In order to, uh, I guess, um, take refuge in... Sorry, let me say it another way. A person must first and foremost fear the Lord. You can see it there in the passage, right? Uh, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack no good thing. If you do not fear him, can you claim that promise that you will lack no good thing? I don't think so. It seems to be conditional. The second is seek the Lord, right? Those... Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him ha have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Can we claim that promise if we do not seek the Lord? Can we say, I lack no good thing if I do not seek him? You see, it's often the case that the Lord in his sovereignty allows and uses hardship to draw us near to him, right? He often removes finances. He often puts his finger on our health. He does all sorts of things so that we will draw near to him. In some ways, prosperity is not a blessing because it can actually insulate us from the one who wants to provide us every good thing. I think there are very few people who can run with a full cup, a full cup of prosperity, if we could say it that way. I know I can't, and I know that when the Lord brings me low, when he removes things from my life, it's then that I latch hold of him with everything I have, with every fibre in my body. If I was prosperous, if I lacked nothing material, I'd probably forget him, I'd probably wander. I probably would not seek him as I ought. Of necessity, the Lord removes from our lives those things which we, in our faithlessness, seek and think will help us. George Mule said it this way, faith begins where man's power ends. The Lord is in the business of bringing us to a weakened state so that we will begin to trust him. So the Lord does all of these things in his goodness to draw us to himself. That is what the goodness of the Lord does. 
Another effect of the goodness of the Lord in the life of the believer is this, verses 11 to 14. The goodness of the Lord turns us from sin. Right? The goodness of the Lord turns us from sin. On the one hand, we turn to God, fearing him alone. Then we experience, him, we experience his goodness. But on the other hand, we're also called to turn away from sin to righteousness. Right? That's what we're called to do. Look at verse 11. David says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Here's the, that was a rhetorical question, obviously. Here's the answer, verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That's David's response of living a godly life and how it is that the goodness of the Lord, experiencing the goodness of the Lord, turns one away from evil. If you will, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, Peter actually uses this psalm to encourage the saints who are living in a context of suffering and persecution, who are being afflicted in every way. And there is something very special here uh, in the way that Peter uses this passage. You'll see in verses 8 to 9 the, the encouragement, the correction, the instruction. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And it's almost as though he's derived that theological instruction from this psalm that he now quotes in verses 10 to 12. He says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer from righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So here, even in the midst of persecution, when one might be tempted to excuse oneself from uh, uh, not doing the commandments because of a context of suffering, Peter says, do good, honour the Lord. It's a response to who God is. And what he deserves. It's a response to the goodness of the Lord. That's what David is saying here. It's a wonderful psalm and it's a wonderful way that Peter has used it in First Peter there. But we go on and there is in verses 15 to 18 yet another effect of the goodness of the Lord in the life of the believer. It doesn't just turn us from sin. But the goodness of the Lord actually brings forth justice. It brings forth justice. And we hear that statement, and you hear this out on the street a lot when you're witnessing to people. If God is love, why does he send people to hell? Right? You've all heard that before, right? If God is loving, why would he send anyone to hell? And I would say it this way. It is because God is loving that he sends people to hell. Right? To love is to be just. It is to plead the cause of the orphan and the widow. It is to recompense the oppressed by judging the oppressor, right? That's what God does. Bringing justice for the oppressed and the afflicted is a great act of love by God. I've been recently going through the book of Joshua at Village Church and I obviously had to answer that question. How was it that God could command the people of Israel to go into Jericho and wipe out man, woman and child? How could he do that? Well, again, the people were so corrupt... They're involved in child sacrifice and all sorts of evil things that it was good and loving of God to bring justice to those people who had suffered at the hands of those evildoers. And we don't often think of it that way, do we? It was the right thing to do, yet to not administer justice, to ignore justice and to let the evildoer go unpunished would be a most unloving thing to the victims of such sinful acts, right? The goodness of the Lord brings forth justice. You can see it there in verse 15. 
The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and he hears, sorry, and his ears toward their cry. And there's a contrast here. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. You can see the contrast and the comparison. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Why is that the case? It's the case because God is good. And he loves what is good and he loves what is right. And he will always judge those who are evil. You cannot but help think that David is speaking perhaps out of his own experience of being one who is righteous and as being one who has felt the wrath and the evil from those who are corrupted. I mentioned Israel earlier and their slavery in Egypt, a people who cried out to God, a God who heard and a God who with mighty, wonderful acts of power came in and delivered them. He judged Egypt. He judged judged Pharaoh, he brought plagues, and he gave justice to Israel. The goodness of the Lord brings forth justice. No one gets away with sin, not in God's sight. I love verse 18. It says here, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. I often use that in a counselling context. When someone is crushed, saddened, perplexed, overwhelmed by life, grief, sorrow that gets them to a place where they're irreconcilable to remind that person that in your sorrow in your suffering the Lord is near to you and he will get justice for you he will come to your aid because he is good we would say it this way that perhaps the oppressor the oppressor might have his day in the sun he might have his time to shine where he can commit his acts of evil but ultimately The Lord will come to the aid of the righteous and the oppressed and he will vindicate the righteous. He will judge the oppressor in righteousness and in truth. Another effect of the goodness of the Lord in the life of the believer is this. Uh, Found in verses 19 to 25, the goodness of the Lord preserves the righteous, right? The goodness of the Lord preserves the righteous, Listen to Psalm 37, 25. Now, you probably know this really well. When I read it, you'll you'll pick up on it. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. The Lord preserves the righteous because he is good. That is what he does. We may be forsaken, by the world, we may be cast out by the world, we may be impoverished, uh, suffering, afflicted, persecuted, but the Lord preserves his righteous people through all of those times and those periods. What did Jesus say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that is a promise that we have. He's with us in trial, he's with us in tribulation, he's with us in life and he's with us in death. We have to remember that our well-being... And that which is best for us is always God's desire for us. That's a promise in scripture. Perfect heavenly father can only ever do that which is good for us. Sometimes that which is good for us comes in the form of a painful lesson or a difficult trial. But nonetheless, we could say it another way. God is incapable of doing anything that is harmful to us in a spiritual context. He's the perfect parent. And you you consider your own life. You are some of you are parents, fathers, grandparents, mothers, and so on. Would you ever do anything that is detrimental to the well-being of your child? You wouldn't. If you're a good parent, you wouldn't. You would run in front of a bus to save your child. You would give your own life. How much more God, who is good and perfect and holy, how much will, will he not always give us all good things and do all things that are good for us? Verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. We we don't deny that. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. That's David's testimony. Verse 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now, we've heard that before. We know that that was fulfilled on the cross when the Lord Jesus Christ hung there. Traditionally, they would break the the femur bones of the person hanging so that they would die quickly because they couldn't hold themselves up by their feet. 
Jesus' bones, according to prophecy, were not broken. The parallel is with the, the Passover, obviously, in the Passover lamb, where its bones were not to be broken. That's the parallel with Christ. Verse 21, affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate righteousness will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. You can see the contrast. You can see the parallels that David is bringing out here. The wicked, the corrupt, they will be destroyed. They will be cast down. The Lord will judge them. But as for the righteous, they will be lifted up. They will be redeemed. Anyone who takes refuge in him will never, ever be condemned. David is wanting the people who he's writing to to be encouraged, to remember these truths so that when they go through the adversity, when they find themselves in a place where they need to be comforted, protected, sheltered, they will run to the Lord their God. David is bearing testimony to this. So the Lord delivers, the Lord rescues. And we could say it this way as believers that the Lord can uh, kind of like Daniel and his three companions who on a few occasions essentially said that the Lord will deliver us and if we should die then we don't care. We will not bow down to you. They saw that death was actually another form of deliverance. That they would get to leave this sin-cursed body and be glorified. And that's what we wait for, isn't it? We know that if we are to leave this body, then we can only, um, I guess, be blessed, if you could say it that way. What did Paul say? To, to live is Christ, to die is what? It's gain. In another place, he actually tells us that when we leave this body, then we truly live. Then we truly live. Then we truly come to life. So for the Christian, for you and I, Crossing that final finish line, finishing the great race, is victory. It's where we receive the crown of life. It's where we meet our Lord. And that is a blessing that comes to those who trust in the Lord. So I, I pray that as we've considered these truths regarding the goodness of the Lord, the kindness of our God, the promises that we are to remember, lay hold of, uh, the realities that should be present in our life, that we would respond like David, that we would see and understand that the goodness of the Lord is a truth to be held onto, a truth to be treasured. And you will find in your own life, when you focus on the goodness of the Lord, who he is, what he does, what he has done, when you take a moment to examine your life and to look back from the day that you turn to the Lord, and perhaps even the times before you turn to the Lord, you will see his hand in every aspect of your life. And you will only ever say that the Lord is good. And though I've come through troubled waters, though I've come through the valley, the Lord has been with me. He's been my rock, my fortress, my provider, and he is good and he will always be good. So this psalm, well, to me, I, I believe the Lord ministered to me through it many years ago in a, in a, a difficult time, a difficult place. I pray that as you've gone through this with me this evening, that you too would be encouraged. Uh, I pray that you would find the same joy and peace that King David found in the Lord his God. And uh, I, I, uh, I just thank you for being able to share this with you, and I pray that it will indeed encourage your hearts. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Uh, Father, we thank you for the rich treasury that we have in your word where we can hear the beautiful and wonderful testimony of a man like King David, a man whose heart was uh, one which was after your own, and, and, and be moved and be encouraged. Uh, I pray, Lord God, that you would continue to mature us and grow us, that we, in our love for you, would be just like King David, that we would be filled with praise, that we would be filled with thanksgiving. And Father... As we come face to face with your goodness and we see it every day and every week and every month and every year, I pray that you would cause this to translate into our lives, uh, hearts and wills which are submissive to your own, where we respond by wanting to take up a cross daily, to deny ourselves and to follow you. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to give ourselves fully to your cause, 
I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to realise that we have been bought with the precious blood of Christ, that our lives are indeed not our own. And Father, as we come face to face with your goodness in saving us, your goodness in providing for us, I pray, Lord God, that we would continue to surrender the, the, the reign and rule of our life over to you, that you would be our Lord, that you would be our master, that we would not move to the left or to the right without first seeking your face and, and wanting to know your will regarding it. We want to give you thanks and we pray, Lord God, that you'll continue to encourage us, continue to strengthen us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all of these things. Amen.